Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. Welcome to the last episode of Season 11. Now this episode is going to be a bit different from anything that we've done before here on Cleaning Up. You've got me and you've also got Baroness Bryony Worthington, my co-host. And what we're going to be doing is reflecting back on Season 11, the things that we liked, the things that we loved, the things that we learned, the things that surprised us, and then we're going to be looking forwards a little bit to the year ahead and some of what we've got lined up in season 12. So, Bryony, you get to say the immortal words. Hello, I'm Bryony Worthington and this is Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe and leave a review. That really helps others find us. Follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram or LinkedIn to participate in the discussion and make sure that you sign up for the Cleaning Up newsletter on Substack. It contains alerts about upcoming episodes and thoughts from Bryony and me on the issues covered. You'll find it at cleaninguppod.substack.com That's cleaninguppod, or one word, dot substack.com Finally, visit our archive of over 150 conversations with the world's climate leaders at cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, the Gillardini Foundation, and Ecopragma Capital. Good to be with you, Michael. Uh, it's very good to see you as always. And uh, I think this is your first sort of full season uh, as a formal co-host. So uh, how have you been finding it? Yeah, it has been. Uh, I've, it's been fantastic. I mean, there's nothing nicer than just spending time with really fascinating people and getting them to answer questions and learn as you go. And uh, the themes that we've taken on have been super interesting. I've learned, I've learned a ton. So yeah, it's been great. And of course, now you're on the other side of the camera. You know, when you first came on Cleaning Up, it was uh, you were actually one of our guests. You was episode you were there for episode twenty five. Um, and it sort of feels not only have you changed sides of the camera, but you know, it was kind of a different time period. That was in the middle of COVID. It was um, January twenty twenty one. It was before Glasgow COP twenty six. It was only something like I don't know, uh, maybe less than a year after the UK moved to net zero as its uh, net as its uh, twenty fifty goal. Um, do you feel sort of older and wiser now? <laughs> well. Yeah, you're right. It was uh, it was different. It's very different being on this side of the camera. I mean, you make it you make it look very easy. But uh, as I've said before, you, it's quite hard to sustain an hour long conversation with almost no edits. So uh, I've been learning that trade and it's been fun learning from you. Uh, and in terms of my outlook, I mean, I, I think I've continued to be relatively optimistic at humans, our human capacity to stand up to this challenge. But I'm I'm increasingly pessimistic that we'll do it in time. And I think the, some of the themes that we've looked at through the season and, and previously kind of, yeah, it's a, it's a combination of kind of slightly uh, despairing at what's ahead of us in terms of the impact, but also hopeful about the number of people who are working on solutions. So, yeah, fear and fear and despair are there, but I'm actually quite optimistic by nature. And, and certainly the people I've met through the season have made me more optimistic. So these conversations, they are snapshots that um you know it is an hour-long conversation it's quite in depth uh, and they really do bear listening to again because i mean our conversation back in january 2021 it is a snapshot of a certain time and if those you know if people in the audience have not listened to it i really do encourage them to do so because it does ca capture the moment and um we were both quite optimistic i mean it's now uh, it's now a lot harder to sort of just say, oh, well, you know, we're net zero. And there's all these all these countries at the time were signing up for net zero 2050. You know, at worst, it was net zero 2060, 2070. You know, we went through that incredible surge of inflation at the end of COVID after that. That made things difficult. The energy prices soaring. And then, of course, you had this horrendous, um, you know, unprovoked attack on Ukraine, which is continuing today by Russia. Um, and you're seeing in politics, I don't want to say some cracks appearing, but it's definitely um, not as straightforward as perhaps you and I saw it back in 2021. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the external conditions have changed radically, right? I mean, to have a war on the doorstep of Europe and, and now in the Middle East, you know, all the uncertainty that's there. 
I mean, it does feel like a gloomier, a gloomier backdrop for sure. And the politics, uh, you know, have been challenging, but uh, and certainly in the UK context, they've been challenging. In the US, I think we've had really quite an interesting turnaround. In some some cases, I'm sure we'll get onto this, but the confidence in the US seems to be growing that climate climate is something that they can benefit from. Um, so yeah, no, it's definitely a different a different world. I think we could have predicted. I mean, we're also when we recorded in the middle of COVID, right? So it was we were already in interesting times, um, and it hasn't really stopped. The, the world continues to be an interesting place. That's right. I suppose um, you know we have also seen the Inflation Reduction Act, and we've seen this kind of essentially a doubling just in that last kind of couple of years. We've seen a doubling of the installations of clean energy. So there has been good news as well. Um, maybe maybe I'm just feeling a little jaded here after uh, you know a, a tough few months. Here we are, you know, quarter of the way through the year, and it already feels like a long year. So if we look at the episodes that um, that you did, do you? Have, we're not allowed to have favorite episodes, right? That's one of the rules. No. So oh, what are your favorite episodes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in terms of up, uplifting conversations, I really enjoyed my conversation with Bonnie Simi at Joby. Uh, Eric, I mean, we, you know, okay, this is a, a small aircraft and it's displacing really helicopters, which are not a massive source of greenhouse gas emissions. But what I liked about it was just the the attitude, the kind of if the world's not right, I'm going to fix it. And uh, the fact that you know she had this amazing back background. And now is, you know, leading this really fascinating company up, up just down the road here in California. So I, I just I find that that was really one of one of my favorites. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, now, I was listening to that and I had two observations. One was, you know, ask her how it's going to decarbonize the world because it's, you know, it is short distance um, electric flight. And of course, the worry there that I was having was, well, if it just makes it easier for rich people to get to airports, to jump on jets, it could actually be entirely bad for uh, the planet. But the other thing that happened while I was watching that episode, I suddenly thought, oh, my God, I know this woman. I've met her. And here's the thing. So she was in the U.S. Olympic luge team and she did her three Olympics. And one of them, or around the time that she was active, I was on the British um, freestyle ski team. I was skiing moguls. And I was at Lake Placid for the World Championships in 1991. And I got injured. I smashed my heels. I really bruised them badly. And I had to go to physiotherapy. And I had to put them into an ice bath. And in an adjoining ice bath, who should I meet? And I only worked it. I only suddenly realized this when I was watching your episode. But Bonnie Simi, who wasn't called that at the time, I don't think. And, uh, and I suddenly realized... I know this extraordinary woman and we've, you know, exchanged a message or two afterwards. And yes, indeed, we did meet 30 years ago in adjoining ice baths. Amazing. Well, you see, that's it. The, the world is full of surprising coincidences. I don't know if you remember, but in the episode, she talks about how she was on a hike and she just bumped into the, the, the person she wanted to speak to at Joby and then sort of the rest is history from that point onwards. So, yeah, chance encounters. She exciting. bumped into Joe Ben Bavert. She bumped into the CEO, uh, a company that she was at the time trying to track down. It is an incredible episode. I think you did a brilliant job of, of you know, uh, going through all the different issues that Joby will have if they're going to bring this uh, electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, um, you know, the VTOL aircraft to, to market. So that was a, a good one. Um, so can so I, can I, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Well, I was going to turn the tables and uh, ask you, Michael. You're not allowed to have a favourite, but what's your favourite? Well, I um, yes, I don't. Do I have a favourite? I may be too politically correct, and I love I love all my children. I love all my episodes. I, I think it was more. I don't have a specific favourite so much as actually a kind of theme that I think really came out this episode, this season for me, which was minerals minerals and mining and processing of minerals. And I think we all realize that there's no transition without a, a ton of you know, more minerals going into the energy sector. So the, you know, they call them critical minerals. They're a rare earth. So there's lots of different um, sort of combinations. We're talking about everything from um, the, you know, they are some kind of weird and, and esoteric ones and neodymium and uh, molybdenum and blah, 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 but also things like copper and nickel and obviously lithium for the batteries and so on so it's a big big theme and I started off the season with Ed Conway who wrote this fantastic book on the material world and that was just a kind of a 
tour of the horizon of the just the physicality of the transition and of the world we live in. Um, there was Mark Kutafani, who I think has been this really um, impressive ESG leader from within the mining industry. And I kept challenging him and saying, but your industry is pretty crap, isn't it? And he kept giving examples of things that he'd done, which were like hugely impressive and, um, and humbling, to be quite honest. Uh, but I was still left thinking, yeah, that's fine, but not everybody is as good as you, are they, Mark? And then I had also um, Professor Sadoway, uh, Donald Sadoway, looking at um, these new new batteries, new processors. And he says, well, if you want batteries to be as cheap as dirt, make them from dirt. And he's got a few different ways of doing that. So those three, those three episodes, I think, worked really well together. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it, they, I, have no, I have no absolute favourite, if I'm honest. Well, I, I wondered, when I was listening to those, it is obvious that there's a theme there. But I did, I, I found myself thinking, well... The, the risk of us focusing on this aspect of the transition too much is that we we live in a different world where you know surveillance is everywhere the, the attention to detail of, of of everybody's actions is greater and the reality is that we're going to be doing a lot less mining when we get through the transition right in, in aggregate if we stop extracting fossils and out of the ground we will be mining but we won't be mining as much in terms of volume and so i worry that we, that gets lost uh, there's an awful lot of risk i think associated with uh, sort of raising the bar so high that we don't we're not allowing ourselves to take this out of the ground um fast enough and we forget that actually what we're doing by doing that is displacing a much more impactful industry which is the fossil extraction industry which you know I, if i I think I think you you I think you you did challenge Mark Kitafani from Anglo America, but I think I actually think you gave him a bit of a an easy ride. Some because that whole sector is responsible for quite a lot of the damage, right? Yeah. Look, throughout the transition, there's always a risk. I think of um, the sort of the new stuff has to be perfect. Right. The old stuff is ghastly. It's ghastly in terms of what it does to the the. Uh, atmosphere. It's ghastly in terms of what it does to local pollution. It's ghastly uh, in terms of what it does, you can call it the Dutch disease, what it does to economies, what it does to corruption. Uh, you know, it's just ghastly on so many fronts. And then, you know, you're trying to do something that's enormously better, but you're being held to this the standard of perfection, which seems entirely unfair. And, you know, a lot of mining is just moving rocks around. You know, there's the, the volume the volume um, may be, you know, you look at this volume versus that volume, but when you're mining for copper, yeah, you're moving a lot of rocks around, but they are rocks. They are large, not entirely, there are water impacts and so on, but they don't mess up the atmosphere in the same way that fossil fuels do. And they're, of course, you know, enormously smaller in terms of absolute volumes. You're absolutely right. Well, and, and also they're recyclable, right? The, the ultimate thing about a fossil fuel is it gets burnt and it's gone. And most of it gets wasted in the process. And, and yet, you know, copper is one of the most, you've, I mean, you've said this in a couple of the episodes, one of the most recyclable materials on the planet. So, and once it's out, we look after it and we reuse it. So, so uh, yeah, that was my main concern is that if we get, if the ESG kind of community gets too, um, concerned or overly focused on this being perfect, it will have a negative effect and, and blind us to the obvious fact, which once we've stopped digging fossils out of the ground, there'll be a lot less mining. So. And that issue of um, recyclable, that was something that I actually explored in, you know, I, I did also during this season, I did the audio adaptation of the two pieces for Bloomberg. Uh, the first was the five horsemen of the transition, five reasons why it's going to be horrible and, 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 and possibly even, in, you know, impossible to get to net zero in a fast time frame and then the five superheroes and one of those superheroes is actually that um the disappearing demand that at the moment we think that this is almost impossible from a minerals perspective because there are there's such huge amounts required but actually not only do you get shrinking demand from the fossil fuel industry uh, of, for all sorts of resources, everything, shipping and pipelines and, and the amount of digging and mining and, and so on, that, or the, the, whatever that we're going to be doing. But also, when you're talking about these critical minerals in a clean energy system, that they do actually get recycled. And as long as the efficiency of using them improves at each cycle, even if you lose a little bit during the reprocessing, if in the interim technology has improved, they are actually forever 
they actually provide the services forever, which is not in any of the modelling. No, no, and and you know, I wanted to ask you about your two um, audio blogs because the uh, I, I listened to the first one, which was the ho- the Horseman of the Apocalypse, the sort of gloom story, and I thought Michael's doing a really good job here of trying to persuade us that he's he's pessimistic, but I I didn't really buy it. And then when it came to the second one, where you unveiled the five superheroes, I mean, I I thought it was excellent. I'd encourage everyone to listen to that one because it's it again hugely uplifting. But the one that the, the final superhero, which I loved, was was the the primary energy fallacy, which I thought you you nailed. And not enough people are talking about this in our sector. You know, this just completely crazy idea that we've got to replace like for like in terms of, of primary energy. So yeah, t- t- tell me you know a bit more about how you felt about that that last episode. Well, so those those two pieces, I'm actually I'm I'm going to be honest about it. You know, I don't have favourites, but I'm really proud not just of the the audio version. I would love it if people listened, in fact, to both of them, because clearly a lot of thought went into them. Um, but also, they do synthesise. You know, they're not a lot of our episodes. Um, you know, and, and you went and did this amazing episode on methane, fugitive methane. That's the episode with uh, Sebastian Birod, Dr. Birod, and then Sharon Wilson juxtaposing these two people working. But it's a deep dive, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas the horsemen and then the superheroes of the transition, it sort of sums up just a whole load of issues. Why is it that this is this transition, um, the topic of the transition, uh, arouses so much kind of oppositionality and tribalism and also why it's so difficult to know who's right. So, you know, I, I, I wrote those two um, to try almost, it was almost like channeling my inner uh, Boris, right? Because famously before Brexit, uh, Boris Johnson wrote one piece saying, we must stay in Europe and here are the reasons. And another one saying, we must leave and here are the reasons to see which he found more persuasive. And obviously, famously, you know, historically uh, of historic importance, he decided that it was Brexit that was more persuasive. So I tried to do the same. I tried to lay out the reasons why the transition can't happen and the reasons why uh, it must and will happen. And but you're right. I wasn't as convinced by the horsemen. In the end, they are sort of I don't want to say temporary. problems. They're terrible problems, but they are. They are of the here and now. You know, how do we get transmission built out? How do we uh, increase mining for minerals? Uh, how do we deal with people who are spreading misinformation? These are all things that we can actually, we have agency, we can deal with. So, you know, you're, I, I also didn't want to depress people too much. If I really wanted to tell people why this is never going to work, I probably could. But I, so I sort of cheated, I guess I'm saying. But then... The the whole the, you know the, the superheroes was the one I really put you know my entire thoughts and soul and being into you know the most persuasive story possible that says this is inevitable yeah I know. that's and, what I tried and, to do well and you you brought your characteristic kind of clarity and and analysis that you know I thought the, the ending on the the primary energy fallacy was great because it leaves you feeling wow okay this isn't as hard as everyone th- thinks it is. Um, there, there is this question of replacing the work, the, the value of energy that we get that is easier to do when you've got better technologies. You know, so, so it just makes the whole thing feel much more tractable. And again, I encourage everyone to listen to it. Just one second. So for those who have not listened to the episode yet or read the, the actual piece, the, it was an adaptation of a piece that I wrote for Bloomberg NEF. Um, and for those who've not listened to it yet, what is the primary energy fallacy? Well, you often hear that uh, renewable energy is so trivial, it only meets, you know, a, it used to be 1%, 2%, 3%. It's now about 4 or 5% of global energy need. And it's always framed as primary energy demand. That, those are the words that get used, primary energy or primary energy demand. And the problem with that is it's not actually demand at all. What primary energy demand is, is adding up all the energy in all the coal with all the energy in all the gas, with all the energy in um, all of the uh, oil that's extracted, with all the energy that's generated from the nuclear fuel. And of course, only a small, well, a minority of that actually provides what I would call what is called energy services. So, you know, if you look at an economy, what it needs is energy services. It doesn't need coal. It needs lighting or it needs cold beers or it needs um, the, you know, the, the, the flying around, the motive power in, a, in an aeroplane or in a car. And that is a much, much smaller quantum. And what happens is that wind, solar 
and hydropower, they produce only electricity. They don't produce this huge amount of thermal waste, which is produced by coal and oil and gas and, and even nuclear. And so it may be a smaller number that they produce, but it's much more efficient at delivering those energy services. And, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. A lot of people just don't realize that if you take that primary energy demand, um, two thirds of it is just waste. Most of it is thermal waste from these from oil, gas, coal and, and a bit of nuclear. So the number when we actually say, oh, you know, we've got we've got to do this transition. The real number we're trying to fulfill is just, you know, it, it's something like 40 percent of primary energy demand. Yeah, and we also touched on it when we really talked to Tamsin Lishman from uh, from the from her green heating experiences at Kenza, right? Because a heat pump, as we went into, can deliver you four units of heat if it's a ground source heat pump for every one you put in. Super efficient. So there, you're not just not wasting all that waste heat from burning something. You're extracting additional value from the the surroundings of the of the of the of the ground. So. It, this this increase in efficiency means that yes we're not having to replace currently what we're doing is, is a very very wasteful system based on fossil fuels and that that's hugely optimistic and that's something we've also talked about a lot in episodes um in the past with Sylvia Madedu and we'll put we can put uh, links in the show notes and also of course Jonathan Maxwell um who has been financing energy efficiency and trying to get people to think about just provide the energy that you need to do the thing. Don't try and replace all the wasteful energy that is currently being squandered on an absolutely heroic scale. By the way, you know, with heat pumps, so Kensa, great episode with Tamsin Lishman, but in fact, um, I've been working with um, an industrial heat pump company um, called Heaton, and they are looking at applications where, never mind a coefficient of performance of four, in some use cases where you're only lifting the temperature a little bit, uh, we're talking about efficiency or co coefficients of performance of seven. Now, that totally blows up the statistics that say you start with coal and then you kind of waste a whole load of it and then you end up with heat uh, and, 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 and electricity because you're getting just so much free heat from the environment or you're recycling. The, you know, the whole point about the heat pumps is that they are also circular, that we, those trend towards circularity of heat so in the um in the five superheroes episode i talk about the circularity of these minerals which go on forever and forever providing their services because you lose a little bit but you become more effective at using them but also heat what you can do in an industrial environment is you can capture your waste heat upgrade it with a little bit of work a little bit of electricity and your plant is then heat circular. I mean, it's just so cool when you when you start getting your head around that stuff. You you can't help but be excited. I don't. Well, think. I, exactly, and this will this will please you. I was in a conference just last week and uh, talking about ground source heat pumps, and in in latitudes where you have quite a high degree of difference between summer and winter, basically the ground acts as a battery. So if you're running your heat pumps to cool yourselves in the summer and you're storing, dumping that excess heat into the ground, when it comes around to winter and you've got to then heat your home, you're basically, the ground has stored some of that heat. So you get more efficient as you go through the year. So there's the, the sort of, the, for me, ground source heat pumps are one of the unsung heroes that I was glad that we were able to profile uh, on this, on this in, in this season. And I'm sure it's something we'll come back to because as you say, uh, the, the, the Kenza application is for us sort of street by street, but there's industrial applications and the, the, there's there's a huge potential there that I think, uh, I hope people will start to take a lot more interest in. Yeah, so the ground source has always been incredibly elegant, um, particularly because the coefficient of performance doesn't drop in winter. The water temperature coming out of the ground is the same winter and summer. So you don't get this, um, you can have a marvellous S cop, the seasonal cop all year round of, of four, but of course, if it gets really, really cold and it drops to two, then that puts a lot of stress on the grid. Well, if you're using ground source, that doesn't happen. So because the, the cop will be the cop, the same cop all, all through the year. So they are, but they've always been a bit expensive. And I think that's what I really like about the Kenza solution, that you're actually, instead of do, doing one borehole or laying out one uh, you know, network uh, subsurface for one building, 
you're now able to share between buildings, multiple buildings. You can do dense housing. You can do um, you can do apartment blocks. And I thought that was a really, really interesting episode. What I wanted to say was, in your um, uh, audio blog about the horsemen, you actually did touch on something which was qu- quite political, because by and large, the, the essays are looking at technological or, or physical uh, barriers. But the, the, the one that you talked about was this... I don't remember the phrase. You have to remind me of, of the of the power of the incumbents that they're going to be people seeding kind of headwinds, artificial headwinds to try and slow this down. And that's something I've always been very interested in. So, yeah, what was the phrase you used? Yeah, so the the first three horsemen of the transition, the first three problems are very kind of. They're, they're sort of technocratic ones, if you like. So there's the cost. It's just sometimes the clean solutions are just not cheaper and can never be cheaper, probably, than the dirty ones. And that's a problem. The second one was uh, the transmission. The third one was critical minerals. Very technocratic, um, you know, techno-economic challenges and, and so on. The, the third one was social and political inertia. That, you know, there's a lot of stuff we could do but there's no country has really decided in full to do it. The UK, of course, has this thing called the uh, Climate Change Act, which you may have heard of. Uh, mm. In fact, you may have written it. Um, but, um, <laughs> I hear it's quite good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's quite effective. But as the Climate Change Committee would always tell us, there are still gaps. We still don't know quite how we're doing it, but we're kind of we're committed to the outcome, even if we're not yet committed to all the policy um, interventions. But most countries... Even if they've gone to Glasgow or Sharm el Sheikh or whichever, you know, global, you know, uh, uh, Dubai, uh, and said they're going to get to net zero, they don't really seem that serious. And the public is not really embracing the measures. They like the theory, but they don't like the practice of maybe spending a bit more. So the, that was the number four was social and political inertia. Number five was actually regulatory capture and um, predatory delay. I called it predatory, predatory delay. delay think, that's it. Yeah. By the way, I think that is straight out of um, Naomi Oreskes, yeah. one of your great yeah. interviews, uh, one of your great conversations that you did in season 10. And that was my number five, which is not only number four, we're not really committed, but number five is, and by the way, there's a whole bunch of people out there that are actively trying to slow it down. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and as you say, we went into that in some, some detail with Naomi uh, last season. And, you know, the playbook that they're using, as uh, she's exposed, is very similar to what happened with tobacco. You know, they, you, there are ways in which you can make things seem less clear. You can muddy the waters. You can cast doubt on the science. And that will mean that we stick with the business as usual case for longer. And so that's exactly what's been happening. And I, I was I was quite pleased this season to... I see this kind of how we communicate about climate change and how we communicate about the solutions as a really important theme. And it's not just about trying to educate the public, but it's mostly about educating our politicians so they know what the right policies are that they need to enact. And and that theme of how do we win hearts and minds, whether it's within parliaments or, or out on the streets, is something that we've looked at a little bit through the episodes we did with David Wallace-Wells and uh, also with Solitaire Townsend, where you both who are in the business of communicating, David as a journalist and uh, Solly as, as a consultant. And it, it is a really important theme because so much of what we talk about is quite technical and happens behind closed doors in policy discussions or, or investment communities that, that doesn't touch the public. But it's a very political problem, this, that we're trying to get through right now. So I like those two episodes that you mentioned there. So um, Solly Townsend and David Wallace-Wells as a pair. I think they, again, should be listened to as a pair because what you've got is David Wallace-Wells is the kind of the champion of trying to communicate fear and using fear. I mean, you know, if you look at what he wrote, uh, what was it, The Habitable Planet and uh, Inhabitable Planet originally. Um, And that was... And that catalyzed real fear. In fact, you know, if you're going to worry about, you know, young people having um, climate anxiety, something we also touched on in the episode with Hannah Ritchie last season, the, the fact that there are young people really terrified of having kids and feeling real anxiety. I mean, if you want to find somebody who's uh, uh, behind that, you'd probably come up with David Wallace Wells in the front row. Um, well, so, and, you know, but you then and I Solly, yeah. but, but Solly, yeah. uh, Solitaire Townsend is the sort of the opposite of that it's changed through inspiration it's the flip side it's saying yeah we can all depress ourselves and frighten ourselves and it is frightening don't get me wrong but 
actually, we have agency and we can do stuff. And she just had some brilliant examples of things she had done um, that were, you know, that were moving the needle. You know, yeah. Maybe not enough to solve climate change, but she was moving the needle. Well, absolutely. I mean, and Solitaire, her strapline is making the Anthropocene awesome. Like she's she's leaning into the fact that there's so many things about modern life that are amazing and there are so many amazing people with great ideas that if you take a solutionist mindset, then it's it's obvious we can make progress and, and we have made progress and we'll continue to. And she is a living embodiment of that. But but going but to defend David's stance, um, he really broke through into the scene as a, as a, as a journalist when he did his first essays on climate, and he didn't get absolutely everything right. But I have no problem at all with somebody playing the role of focusing on the long tail extreme risks of climate change. And far too often we focus on the average, the kind of the the modelled mean, if you like, which actually may not bear any relationship with what the real planet experiences. You know, average temperatures over time and over the planet don't help you when you've got a heat dome in Canada that's killing people. So it's it's kind of important that we talk about the extremes. And I think he he took a really interesting stance of saying, well, let's just do that thought experiment. What is the worst case scenario? And nothing he said was really very wrong. That the, there are scenarios now where you've got high climate sensitivity, where we've already blown it, right? We've already changed the parts per million to such an extent where we could see very extreme responses. Now, we, we, I'm sure you and I will get into conversation about this, but it, it feels to me that someone should be sounding that alarm and that we should be treating this as a risk-based problem where there are some impro improbable but high impact risks that we should be taking taking note of and thinking about when we just have this discourse. Yeah, so I had um, a technical issue with uh, what he was writing about because when you say that he wasn't that they weren't wrong the problem is that what he had what he was doing was reading all of the papers of you know what how awful it might get by 2100 or even before then but those papers almost without exception were based on this extreme scenario called RCP 8.5 now sort of fans of the show or anybody who's followed me on Twitter will know all about my beef with RCP 8.5 because it requires burning seven to time seven to ten times as much coal as we currently burn. And the coal industry, you know, even though China is building coal-fired power stations, as we heard about in the episode with Lauri Milavirta, another great episode this season, by the way, for those who've not uh, listened, um, but the coal industry is essentially flat and has been for a decade, more than a decade. And so, you know, this scenario that the IPCC has been using, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to use the word promoting, is not a feasible, plausible scenario. And so, of course, it's kind of, it's a bit like saying, well, I want to know how my cat's physiology would respond to telecom towers and, um, you know, and, and electromagnetic uh, you know, uh, ra radiation. So I'm going to put it in the microwave. Well, obviously, we know what happens if you put the cat in a microwave, and we know what happens well, if, we burn, okay. if we burn seven to ten times yeah. as much coal. We know what happens, which is you know really, really, really bad. And you can do a New York Times bestseller, and and of course, everybody's very terrified. Yeah, but the, no, but I, so but I, yeah, yeah. I'll let, I'll let, but because so just to come in on that, I mean. The problem is that there are degrees of sensitivity beyond the actual release uh, of fossil fuels absolutely. that Ab take you to the same scenarios, well, right? Well, no, they don't take you to the same scenarios. We, we don't know that. Why? No, we don't because, know. That's the because what we, we do is know. we research using RCP 8.5. Now, what we what the, thing that I'm scared, the, well, the thing that I think that where, we, where we're headed with this is um, we are essentially on track for not even RCP 4.5, right? Not even a medium scenario. We're actually tracking, our emissions are tracking below RCP 4.5. They're tracking below the scenarios that are in the US climate assessment as good, as successful, right? That we're doing fantastically on emissions. The problem is the sensitivity, the stuff that's happening is worse. Right. But you can't research what happens. You can't research how what the implications are by well, you can. a you cat just have, in a microwave. Have, that doesn't tell to, you. No, but you just have to abandon your faith in models as the answer for everything. Right. Because actually the models are 
are very divergent. You, know, you look at the different ways that they run and it's because it's an inherently complex problem, like the most complex problem. We're talking about global climate here where there are so many parameters that the models have to just interpolate or guess or put in holding values because they don't know the answer. So these models are almost certainly wrong. But what you can do is look at observable data that's coming back from the natural environment. And in that, on those and that observable data, you can see that we're deviating from the norm very fast, uh, and that, that and we should that's right. a cause for concern. Right. Brian, one hundred percent. The question is, however, whether the way to explore that is by putting the cat in the microwave. Right. Another example: if you want to know, say you put um, you put some milk onto in a saucepan on the stove, and you want to understand how do I make sure it doesn't boil over, right? If you put that stove on 10 and watch it for an hour, it's going to boil over, number one, absolutely, a bad outcome. But number two, you're going to learn nothing about how to avoid where it actually, what are the oh, sensitivity, well, what are those, what are those yeah. intervention points, right? But I don't so think what, we're disagreeing on that. I mean, I, I don't think the IPCC and the IAM models are useful. I honestly think we've taken a wrong turn by relying too much on these oversimplified models that as you say are completely wrong in their assumptions they don't have they don't have learning in them in terms of technology uptake you're asking a bunch of climate scientists to do a job which is really the job of of the economy to try and predict what happens and they've got it badly wrong I, i'm completely with you on that but it's perfectly fine i think for a journalist coming new to this to, to ask the question what are, what's at risk here what, what are we risking and he's subsequently carried on studying this and he's now has corrected some of those uh, those assumptions, but it hasn't made him any less worried because what's happened in the meantime is the physical environment is sending us very strong signals that we're into a very deeply changed situation where the the, the current recorded anomalies that we're seeing are so far off pre predicted norms that it it's it becomes scary, right? So therefore, fear is a legitimate response, I think. Bryony, you've achieved something I never thought would be achievable, which is I'm now going to defend climate scientists, because I think rather than say the models are all wrong, I think what we need to be doing is focusing those models on the sort of the future as it really plausibly might be. In other words, we now know what we're emitting and what the likely trajectories are. And we are we need to spend a lot more time thinking about the sensitivities there and this is my segue into talking about an episode that I really enjoyed, um, which was your methane hunters, because there you've got um, a scientist who's really getting to grips. This is Sebastian uh, Birol. You, you spoke to two people on that episode, the scientist Sebastian Birol first, who's really trying to understand uh, how do you measure the methane? How do you know where it's coming from? How do you know what its impact? This is absolutely fantastic um, scientific endeavor. And then you'd spoke to Sharon Wilson, who's going around and actually filming using a, a thermographic camera and saying the industry is essentially uh, either lying or, or failing to measure and can't be trusted. So two sides of the coin on a really immediate problem, a really immediate short-term problem, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and no, we, we um, well, I, the, the interview with Sebastian was actually longer than the, that made it into the episode because you're absolutely right. Sebastian is one of those scientists who's out in the field measuring greenhouse gases. Um, we've got a good handle on concentrations at a global level, but we really haven't got a good handle on what's happening at a, at a local level in terms of the fluxes, right? We emit and then nature absorbs a certain amount and so far, we've been on a relative. We've been given a bit of an, a, an easy pass, right? At least half of what we emit is being reabsorbed back into the natural world through the oceans or the trees, um, or the tree, through vegetation. That could all start to change quite radically, and it's only through observational data that we'll know that. We won't. The models can't cope with this. It's it's got to come from people like him going out with flasks or with measurement towers and tracking what's happening underneath it all. Because what we do know is CO2 is rising and we know that methane is rising even faster. It's it's much less um, concentrated in the atmosphere, but it's a much more potent greenhouse gas. So we should care about it. But when you dig into that methane question, there's still a huge amount of uncertainty about why it's rising quite so fast. They don't even really know where. We've got a limited number of sites that are measuring it. 
Um, and there had, the reason we, we focused that episode on methane was because around that time, there was this uh, wonderful satellite that was launched. And it was the first civic society funded satellite, which is, tells you something about how the costs of, of technology is coming down. Um, and that had just gone into orbit and it will soon start beaming back evidence of where we've got big pollution of, of methane, the sort of super pollutants. But, you know, why I like Sharon and, and her approach is that she's like, yeah, well, they're all a bit giddy about this satellite, but we've known this data forever. And, and knowing the data and acting on it are not the same thing. So so it was a really interesting episode to get those that Sebastian's really kind of deep academic approach. And then but, um, uh, Sharon, who's this sort of much more of a kind of local campaigner who's who's very concerned that the industry has been doing this for years brazenly and unless something really changes politically, we'll carry on doing so. So it was fascinating. It was. And uh, I, I will say I was um, it's really worth persevering with for anybody who's tried to listen to it. And the first bit with Sebastian, the sound quality, unfortunately, is, is not where I would like to, to, to see us go. Um, but it's really worth persevering. And it does get better with the, the, the section with Sharon. But it was fascinating because you've got um, you've got the satellites that are up there and you've got all of the kind of satellite edge lords you know who think that satellites and and big data and uh, machine learning and large language models are basically going to solve everything and then you've got sebastian who's got his towers above the forest actually trying to work out well hang on a second um you know you've got to kind of link the satellite readings to you've got to actually get granular and do some you know really good science there and then on the ground you got sharon going it's them it's them and i can prove that it's them because i got my camera so you go from satellite to towers to camera and you also go from um how can i put it you know i don't want to maybe uh, they're not all edge lords but you know from the sort of pure technologists to scientists to citizens and pressure so you know it i it, it was a fascinating um sort of x-ray of that methane problem. What are the levers that we've got? Informational, but also kind of the different theories of change around getting our, to grips with methane. I don't know that I was left enormously optimistic, but I was definitely more informed afterwards than before. Yeah, well, so you're absolutely right. And what was so apparent was uh, that, you know, the academic approach actually, and, and it's probably a temperament thing, was that uh, uh, Sebastian wants to work with the companies. He, he wants to be able to get access and be able to work with them to identify where there are problems and then fix them. Um, and and so, so his solutions are quite sort of industry friendly. Whereas Sharon, you know, as a recipient of this pollution into her home, into her home and into her environment is absolutely distrustful of them and wants something much bigger, you know, a kind of regulatory external approach. And, uh, and the truth is it's going to need both, you know, we're going to need to have progressive companies doing the right thing. And we're going to have to have something that brings up the floor for everyone, because there's always going to be bad actors and you, and you need, you need a regulatory standard that they're all kept to. So yeah, it was, it was a fascinating episode. Um, so I, I'm going to do a, a super synthesis of a simple synthesis of, of your episodes. You know, I was, I was off doing, you know, minerals and mining and kind of crunchy engineering stuff other than the, the horsemen and whatever, but, but yours, you know, we talked about how, you know, David Wallace Wells, fear as the theory of change. Then there was Solly Townsend, inspiration as the theory of change. But then you've got Sebastian Biron with knowledge as the theory of change. And you've got then Sharon Wilson as pressure and agitation and anger, frankly. She was, she's angry about this stuff that has impacted her life as a theory of change. And I just think that is such a fascinating sort of set there. Yeah, well, and also in the middle, you've got um, Bonnie and Tamsin who are saying capitalism is the answer, right? Which is kind innovation. of I Innovation. Innovation yeah, is exactly. the theory of change. What a brilliant yeah. set of, you know, how, how did you think of, of, of you know, <laughs> that set of uh, well, particular interviewees? <laughs> exactly. A lot of careful planning. And as you know, I worked it all out in advance. No, I mean, you know, they, these, ep these seasons come together through a combination of, of, of good luck, you know, meeting people and then being available. But the, these themes are eternal themes, I think, and they're going to keep coming coming back. You know, I'm, you know, thinking back to your episodes, we haven't talked about it very much, but one of the ones I really valued was uh, Larry, Larry Milliverta's episode, where there you had a very sober, 
uh, quite, you know, he was, didn't get excited about you know, anything. A Swede, very level-headed, but ex-Greenpeace, spoke five different languages, was essentially compiling all this amazing data on China that no one else knew, thanks to his Mandarin skills, and, and pushing this out in a way that was really driving people. In fact, dr- drove your opinions, right? Absolutely. And you call him very sober and very unemotional. But, you know, um, he's actually Finnish. And that is an extremely excitable Finn, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right. I got the no. nationality wrong. I, I, I always feel, feel very uncomfortable now because I've been sort of I'm making, you know, using um, stereotyping when I shouldn't. I just think he's absolutely um, an unsung hero of all of this. I mean, this guy starts by delving through you know, the output in Chinese, in Mandarin Chinese on air quality, and then joining the dots with data that's coming out of the US um, embassy, the air quality monitor on the roof, the one that suddenly started to say that the air quality was, um, was crazy bad. But then, you know, it's a combination of extremely good data uh, research and manipulation and combination. um, And, uh, and then distributing and getting it out there in ways that people like I can use. So, you know, I, I get lots of, you know, attention and you get lots of attention, hopefully more and more through cleaning up and so on. But there's these these heroes. You know, I would also say, by the way, Sebastian Birod, Sharon, you know, uh, yeah. as well. But Lowry has just done such extraordinary work. And then, of course, what happens is Russia invades Ukraine and everybody says, oh, we should put sanctions on. And it's like, OK, sanctions on what? How much gas? How much oil? From where? Being sold to whom? Via what pathway? And guess what? Lowry Milavirta and his team have probably done, you know, there may be some shadowy agencies doing that work. But in the world that we inhabit, he is doing the best possible work on that topic. And he's informing a civic and a, a debate and a really important one. Yeah, no, it was, it was a really great episode, as you say. One we haven't touched on, which I thought was really funny, and it's definitely worth listening to the end of, was your episode with um, Donald Sadaway, who, I mean, what an extraordinary, another extraordinary character. And, but, you know, what's funny about listening to the very end, like, I mean, let's, let's, I would have loved to have taken his chemistry classes. You know, it, it sounded like he was a brilliant communicator. And then at the very end, because obviously his extreme electrochemistry has this capacity to potentially be a new way of producing steel, right? You know, we might be able to get rid of the traditional way. So he's essentially part of the electrification story. But then you get to the very end and he suddenly decides he doesn't like electric cars. And you were so restrained. I loved it. But tell me how that felt. So first of all, Brownie, if you want to take his course, you still can, right? Because it's all online. Um, MIT was first in line when it came to these things called MOOCs, massively online something something courses, they chose his course uh, to pilot it, to pioneer it. And so you can still, and that's how actually I think that's how Bill Gates took his course, not directly with him, but actually online. But anyway, no, he, so he is this, um, again, another almost like a sort of, I don't know, a biblical prophet on making batteries dirt cheap because you make them from dirt. Uh, but also an extraordinary um, Renaissance man educator. You know, just such an interesting character. Um, but you're right. At the end, he says, "Oh well, you know, you, you, we can't. I'm not. You know, we can't electrify uh, transportation. It, it's not working, and it's too expensive." And so, well, but hang on a second. So what he's trying to do is really, really cheap bulk power um, to sit behind the grids and enable them to work through when there's no wind, when there's no sun and so on. And I think I'm going to be charitable. I'm just not sure that he has worked that much on the problem of electric, uh, you know, batteries for cars, because, you know, I see what's happening in terms of cost reduction, in terms of energy intensity improving, in terms of cycle life increasing. Um, And so I I begged to differ. I did actually say... I didn't want to, I, we just didn't have time in the episode to, for me to get into a, an argument as we just have, you know, in this episode on RCP 8.5. I'd have loved to have gone there, you know, with the great Donald Sadaway. I, he probably would have, you know, explained to me why I'm wrong. But 
I didn't have time, so I just said, well, I think I would disagree on that, and I was restrained, and I moved on. You were on. very restrained. Well, I, 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 I could feel, I, I'm, having now been on this side of the mic, I knew exactly what's going through your mind. It's like, it's 55 minutes in. I don't think the audience wants us to go here. But, but what, you know, what that episode then though does highlight, I think, for me sometimes, is that there is this great love of the new, the, the, the hard to do, the you know, focus on innovation, and actually listening to his explanations of ele- his extreme electrochemistry, I was left thinking, gosh, that just sounds like it might just be too extreme. Like that it just, you might, you might have this amazing tool set and you may find, be finding these solutions, but they might just never become commercial. And, and actually, uh, and then, and in, in your pursuit of that, you're kind of ignoring the obvious thing, which is lithium ion batteries in cars work brilliantly and everyone loves them. So, you know, it's sort of for me highlighted this risk of, this obsession with always on the very frontier of science in, in, to the detriment of what's available today. Well, I think that he's solving with his extreme electrochemistry batteries, these dirt cheap batteries. It's a bit different from cars because cars, obviously, they've got to be mobile and not burst into flames ever, ever and all those sorts of good things um, and, and be you know light enough and have the range and so on. Um, so I think it's kind of both and. But the process that's really impressive that is this Boston Metals process for directly reducing uh, iron ore with electricity. So if that works, can be made to work, and it can be made to work in the laboratory, but if you can make it scale up, then of course it casts a shadow or it, it probably puts all of this hydrogen steel stuff out of business. So that is a really big, but look, interesting, a pair of episodes um, that, that if, the, if the, um, the audience is looking for sort of two episodes to listen to on a weekend put together, here's an idea. How about Donald Sadoway, Professor Donald Sadoway, and Bonnie Simi of Joby looking through that innovation lens? Because if I said to you that Bonnie Simi was going to take over and try and make some of Donald Sadoway's stuff work, you would probably sit there and go, hmm, that's the likelihood of it actually happening has probably just gone up, right? <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, that's a good thought experiment, isn't it? That uh, if we got all of our people in a room, what would they come up with? Let's just finish, if we can, Brian, uh, by looking forwards. Um, so we've got both uh, some episodes lined up, some people we want to talk to, uh, but also we've got an incredible three quarters of a year left. Um, the kickoff of season 12 is going to be with uh, Dr. Ma Jun. Um, now, Dr. Ma... Most people listening to this probably haven't heard uh, about what he does. He is the, the I would not even just the guru, but he's the leader of green finance in China. And actually through the G20 and through various initiatives, he's one of the leaders of green finance in the world. Um, he's worked very closely with Mark Carney, um, somebody that we've had on cleaning up in the past uh, and is probably much better known to many of the audience. Um, but there's a fascinating link to this season, which is that he was switched on to the need for finance to be um, uh, uh, to become part of the fight against climate change and other sustainability issues, other environmental issues, by the same air quality episode as Lowry Milavirta talked about in his episode. So the Dr. Ma Jun episode is actually a pair with Lowry Milavirta. Um, so that's going to kick off season twelve. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anybody else that we can talk about that we've, well, that we've got we, lined we up. Can, well, we can we can certainly, um, well, but hopefully, because as we know, these things sometimes change. But my first episode, I'm hoping, is going to be with Lily Cole. The, the, the sort of, she's, she's written a book called Who Cares Wins? And uh, she's an incredibly thoughtful person on the transition. And it continues my sort of theme of how do we communicate this? How do we bring people forward in hearts and minds? So I'm, I'm really looking forward to having that conversation with her. Um, and she's early been, on in my. She's been very vocal about the issue of uh, justice in the transition and the rights of indigenous peoples. So maybe that episode will be a, pa- a pair with Mark Kutufani. Who knows? Let's see how it turns well, maybe. out. Well, but yeah, I do hope to. Yeah, I, I look forward to yeah. listening to that one. And it, but it's a big year politically. I mean, obviously we've got the U.S. election coming up. Um, that will be in November. Um, and then possibly a UK election. But some people are calling it the year of elections because there's, there's others around the world. Well, before that, we, we've got the election in the European Parliament. 
right? So, the, you know, Europe goes to the polls and that's likely to return a different, differently uh, constituted a European parliament. And as, a, as Europe's been one of the engines of, of kind of green transition, it's, as people are going to be watching that one too. Does it actually matter who's in the European Parliament? I mean, I'm I'm not sure. I know, look, we could have a really good debate about this, but yes, it does. 300 and something million people um, represented into one parliament. They do still have quite a lot of uh, powers, uh, certainly a spending power. Um, and it, it, but, but more than that, I think what people are watching it because of the the backlash, if you like, or the or the rise of populism in certain key economies in Europe. And people use their European uh, parliamentary elections as a protest vote. So you could see quite a, a, quite a, a very diverse and polarised parliament be sent back to Brussels. So one to watch. And, and in fact, um, the backlash was one of the things that I talked about in the fourth horseman of the five, in the horseman of the uh, uh, transition apocalypse, because there are these parties like uh, Marine Le Pen's party in France or the uh, Alternative for Deutschland in Germany. Um, Mark Rutter just got uh, deposed because of farmers pushing back against, among other things, but farmers pushing back against environmental measures. Um, and obviously we've seen that uh, in the UK, the Conservative government, Rishi Sunak's government, I think it's fair to say signalling more than doing, but at least signalling quite a big um, uh, pulling back from climate ambitions as a result of pressures uh, being felt by the population. So this this kind of pushback, this populist pushback, France, very famously, the yellow vests, which is where that pushback kind of initially bubbled right to the surface and was mirrored in Canada. So I suppose we could see that, you're saying, in the European elections. Well, yeah, I, I think I think most people are expecting it, and I think there's a quite high degree of concern. I mean, you, you know, not to get uh, onto one of my favourite hobby horses, but you know, a lot of this is about the way in which you introduce policies on climate, doing it sensibly and doing it in ways that feel fair to people. And I'm afraid uh, Germany, as one of the biggest countries in Europe, hasn't got it right. You know, they've they've tackled climate in a particular way. They've done the world a huge service and they've brought forward, you know, cost reductions in solar like nobody else. But they switched off perfectly reasonable nuclear power stations, which made them more reliant on fossil fuels. And they've they've got very high costs of electricity. They've seen an industry leaving. And then they tried to um, move very kind of quite hard into home electrification without really educating the populace or taking people with them. And there's been a big backlash. So, you know, it's it's a. Um, it's a cautionary tale, and I, I think getting the policies right, communicating them, and and making uh, making people aware of why they're needed and why they're fair, is something that needs. That's why communications is such a crucial part of this transition. So that opens up uh, uh, the potential for an entire season of Germany's mistakes in the energy vendor. Um, <laughs> exactly. and, and nuclear, of course, among them, by the way, is becoming enormously uh, to the tune of whatever it is, 55% of their gas dependent on Russia. So there's plenty of mistakes that we could, uh, plenty of, it's a rich seam we could mine there um, to use the coal mining analogy very apt in uh, well, Germany exactly. today. But in, in Europe, obviously, um, we've got those elections, then we've got um, potentially a UK election could be at the end of the year, could be in 2025. But the big one, the big one, I'm sure we're all, you know, watching um, with trepidation, frankly, is the US. Is it as important for climate, clean energy innovation as um, perhaps you could say the 2020 election, which really was, you know, critical? Uh, you know, I guess it's a way of asking, do we think that the Inflation Reduction Act is so embedded that it really doesn't matter even if uh, Donald Trump is elected again? Or, you know, how critical is it when you take all the froth away? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is the it is the big one, and I'm sure we're going to be it's going to dominate discourse. I mean, it's it's you know, as you say, Trump was defeated by Biden. Biden came in and, against all odds, pulled off quite a significant number of policy wins that have have unlocked a lot of money. And this is you know, it's a very he had a very narrow majority. It was, didn't look very promising, and yet they pulled it off. And I I suspect there are now enough moderate Republicans who can see that 
we, we need to we need to hold on to reasons to invest back into the US economy that the US has been largely focused on financialization and and digital platforms for too long we need to get back to building back to manufacturing and that i think will probably hold and because the investment in the green economy is going hand in hand with a huge boom in fossil fuel extraction in the US uh, that this kind of energy sovereignty or energy independence rationale for investment will continue even with a with Trump in the White House he may pick some uh, iconic fights that he wants to dismantle uh, you know, but and, and and you might see him lean in uh, against a particular part of the transition maybe electric vehicles because he seems to hate those but but by and large i think the big pieces of architecture that biden managed to get through uh will hold because it's it's mostly benefiting republican states yes i'm never convinced by this idea that republican states because they get uh, inflation reduction act money will be persuaded that this is therefore uh, that climate change is real and that climate change should be addressed and so on. Uh, because, you know, we have seen, um, you know, Trump's voters voting and, and being, you know, vocal against Obamacare whilst actually benefiting from Obamacare. So there's not a huge amount of rationality there. Um, but what's fascinating, I suppose, a lens to see this through is actually um, what Lauri Milavirta talked about, which was that China's, and it also comes up in the episode with Dr. Ma, which kicks off season 12, which is that actually China's economy was almost precisely becalmed, right, almost in recession, other than the growth of the um, the clean energy sectors, the solar and the wind and the EVs, the electric cars and so on. So, you know, if these industries continue to grow and continue to be dynamic, then it could be very difficult for any politician, just because they are so big, it could be very difficult for any politician to then threaten to shut them down or indeed to take action to try to shut them down or impede them. Exactly. And, and actually, we saw a little micro version of that in the, in the UK, when, in, as you alluded to. Um, Rishi Sunak decided that basically on the, ba on the basis that they'd won a by-election by weaponizing uh, the ULEZ, which is a, a congestion charging policy that was expanding into, into, into a bigger area, and they managed to defeat uh, Labour in that by-election. And so they extrapolated from that that, oh, that's good, so we can beat Labour if we go anti-green. And they tried to do a kind of, you know, big, you know, kind of dog whistle move against uh, climate change. But what they found was there's actually a high degree of support in industry and investment for continuing on the path we've chosen because it is driving manufacturing jobs back into Britain. And the, the policy that I'd been tracking in detail was the, the mandate to sell electric vehicles. And, you know, there was a great fanfare that this was going to be stopped or, or blocked. And actually, virtually nothing changed. That policy came in and started in January 2024, requiring manufacturers to sell a rising percentage of electric cars. It tops out now at 80 percent of all cars sold will be electric in 20, 2030. That's quite a big policy that a Tory government passed whilst claiming to be anti-green. So the money knows that this is the future and, and you know, money talks. So. It's very it's very hard to unravel this this now once it's gathered, gathering momentum. Yeah. So when um, Rishi Sunak announced the changes to these various policies, I wrote something uh, actually on my Substack, um, which you know the audience is is welcome to find. It's the thoughts of Chairman Michael. The, th the Substack is called Thoughts of Chairman Michael, uh, no pun intended. Um, and um, I wrote something about the great the climate reset, a big fat nothing burger. Because actually, although pushing back the 2030 date for vehicles and so on, everybody knows that the bulk of land transportation is going electric and it's over a tipping point. And then there was these other sort of resets around heating. Well, the heating has been, that is at the moment just so poisonous, the debate in the UK, because of the actions of people like uh, the Energy Utilities Alliance with their predatory delay and sparking outrage about heat pumps. Really, there was no alternative but to push uh, some of the dates back. But in fact, what you've really seen since then, or the, around the same time and since then, has been doubling down with more money the seven and a half thousand pounds per heat pump of subsidy for somebody installing one. You've seen um, 
the 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 uh, new battery factories for EVs being attracted to the UK, with by the way extremely good support from the government. Um, you've seen the um, the rules on heat pump, the mix of heat pump versus boilers. I think it's pushed back by one year, but fundamentally the main policy that's going to actually penalise boilers still in place, surviving that. So it's kind of like there's a reset, but it's really a rhetorical reset. It's yeah, not a real exactly. e economic reset at all, is it? No, it's not. And the fact that they had to invent policies that were never being proposed to, to them yes. say they were never going to do it. We're not going to have seven bins for recycling and we're not going to force you to have a, a meat tax. Those were never even policies. So, And let's not forget, Tories have been in government for 13 years. So where were they getting these ideas from? So it's, it's anyway, it, 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 I think what's happened now is that there's, there is this growing realisation that this transition is unstoppable because it's just going to provide us with a better system overall, more efficient, and that there's money to be made now because you're going to be seeing incumbents contracting and new and new entrants growing. So it's, it's a hard thing now to stand up against and say we're going to scrap it because people are betting on it. So are we going to see Labour then um, spend that famous £28 billion a year that they promised and then they unpromised and they promised it again and then they've unpromised it? Uh, are we going to see them adhering to your logic and actually making a decision that it's needed and it's going to go ahead and it's going to happen? Well, um, if, they, if, they, if they don't need to spend public money, right, Michael? And this is where I think we'd agree that you can set the rules of the game and the private capital will flow. And if they focus on that, m many more than 28 billion will be unlocked. So whether or not you do public spending to, to stimulate this, I think that's the wrong, when, the wrong length, end of the telescope to be looking at the problem. It's how do you get the big flows of capital back, back flowing into the UK and into, into our economy? And that's, that's going to be by setting good rules. So, Brian, we're not going to have time to go through uh, a tour of all the different political situations that I think you and I are keeping an eye on. There's Canada, fascinating. Australia, they've gone absolutely nuclear bonkers in Australia. Um, and uh, you might think that that's a good thing. I might have some extreme scepticism about whether building a nuclear power station in Australia can ever be done economically. They're not going to do um, it. They're not going to do it. Gonna, they're not going to need to. I, no, my own view, fine. they should... They should um, Get rid of the ban on nuclear um, because they're not going to build one anyway. Yeah, exactly. so it doesn't matter. No, no, so they completely. should just yeah. draw the poison of that stupid tribal warfare that they seem to absolutely be enjoying at the moment. But anyway, we'll have lots more of those uh, and we will uh, bring in the right guests to enlighten people, entertain people, uh, inform people. Um, uh, and uh, and it's going to be enormously good fun. So thanks. I mean, I want to thank you, Brownie, for you know your the work you've done as uh, uh, my co-host. And I think it's been a fantastic season and I got high hopes for season 12. And well, you know, we'll see our audience there. Hopefully they'll join yeah. us. Well, I wanted to thank you, Michael. Uh, it's been a fantastic opportunity. I've completely loved uh, season 11 and all the guests that we've had. And I'm looking forward to more. So yeah, onwards. So that brings to an end season 11 of Cleaning Up. We're going to be taking a two-week break and we'll be back on Wednesday, the 24th of April. Now, over Easter, we've got two pieces of homework for you. The first is please sign up for our newsletter. And you can find that on cleaninguppod.substack.com. Cleaninguppod.substack.com. And the second, Bryony? We'd really like you to write to us. We would like to hear your feedback, your questions and your guest suggestions. So please find us on LinkedIn, Instagram, or on X slash Twitter. And we really look forward to hearing from you. So he was Michael Liebrich. I'm Bryony Worthington. And that was Cleaning Up. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Cleaning Up, or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And do please spread the word. Tell your friends and colleagues. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, the Gillardini Foundation, and Ecopragma Capital.